Before I start reading, I'd like to thank Liz for doing this event with me and for the glorious introduction she wrote to my book. I'm in awe of you, Liz. And I'm You're welcome, Hilma. It's totally my pleasure. Very, very much my pleasure, both of them. Thank you. And I wanted to thank Emma Straub for having us and tell her that I'm very happy to be back in Brooklyn, sort of, at least virtually. I was born in Brooklyn and grew up in Brooklyn. You may have noticed my Brooklyn accent. And I want to thank Serena, too. Uh, I'm going to read from the final story in the book, the only really new story in the book. And I'm only going to read a short passage. Um, it's, the story is called The Great Escape. And um, it's at the beginning of the pandemic when people are starting to keep their distance and Zoom is introduced. I have to say part of the reason I chose this is because this is a Zoom event. And the other reason is because I'm so proud of myself for finally mastering Zoom after some <laughs> disastrous things. I hope, hope nothing happens tonight. All right, I'm going to begin. It was my friend Ruth's turn to host our book group, but on the advice of her son, Jeffrey, a radiologist, she called everyone to change the venue. We were going to have a Zoom meeting, whatever that was, instead of convening at her place. There was much, much nervous back and forth among the members of the group about the, this latest development. All of the members of the group are in their 80s and 90s. It sounded easy enough though, we'd all receive a link and at the specified time, we would simply open it and go from there. Ours was strictly a women's group and the few husbands still around were usually banned from our meetings. Whenever it was my turn, I took my laptop into the living room where the refreshments were laid out and Howard skulked off to the bedroom like a grounded teenager, closing the door behind him. But the Zoom meeting changed all of that. Enough aloneness. We had to stick together. Ruth, long a widow, sorry, would have Jeffrey right beside her to help facilitate things. And I invited Howard to sit next to me on the bed with the laptop between us. I hit the link and waited, the way our ancestors must have waited for the flickering magic lantern to do its thing. After what seemed like a long time, the screen filled with a notice that our meeting would begin soon. Well, this is exciting, I said. Mrs. Bridge was my favorite novel with its brief, brilliant paragraphs like vaudeville blackouts and characters I would think about wistfully as if they were old friends with whom I'd lost touch. I loved Mrs. Bridge, even when she exasperated me. She was the product of her circumstances, of her time and place, but I still wanted her to have more insight and more courage and to make better choices the way I'd once wished for a happier outcome for Emma Bovary and Anna Karenina. I was gripping my dog-eared underlined book and looking forward to saying some of all that when our meeting began, if it ever did. Suddenly, Ruth's and Jeffrey's faces loomed before us almost as big as life. They were both wearing the kind of masks my daughter Anne said you couldn't buy anymore for love or money. Then one of them seemed to bark, piercingly, and Jeffrey shouted, mute, Ele Evelyn, mute. Evelyn Lasky <laughs> and Mildred, her ancient, incontinent, and yappy Maltese. How, Evelyn cried, oh, oh, what do I do? While Mildred barked in frantic unison. Just hit your damn mute button, Jeffrey commanded through his mask as muffled and menacing as Darth Vader. And shut that dog up. So much for his bedside manner, I thought, but didn't say, what if I wasn't muted either? Then the faces of all the other women in our book group popped up, each in a separate little frame, like the celebrities on Hollywood squares. Some of the women's mouths were moving soundlessly. Only Evelyn's frame was empty until she whizzed by calling, Mildred, stay, come. Everyone else unmute, Jeffrey ordered. And soon there was a cacophony of voices, a chorus of confusion and dismay. And someone's cell phone chirped and chirped. So this is what I've been missing all these years, Howard said. Then Ruth was in the center of the screen again, sounds Jeffrey, holding up her copy of Mrs. Bridge, 
and wiggling it. Sit down, settle down, people, she said, like the middle school teacher she had once been. Now, who would like to begin? I raised my hand and leaned eagerly forward, the way I had in AP English, just as the connection was broken and everyone grew silent and disappeared. Fabulous. That hasn't That's happened wonderful. to us, has it? <laughs> Thank you so much for reading that, Hilma. It's just fabulous. And let's hope we all can stay right where we are right now and stay, stay here. Um, anyway, it's my real pleasure to be here with you and talking to you tonight. And um, I thought, I just want to say that I want to start with the title of this, of this collection, Today a Woman Went Mad in the Supermarket. Um, it, it, the title itself feels almost like a poem to me because it's so straightforward, truthful, and filled with mystery. And when we finish the story, there's still a sense of mystery, uh, which I just love. So what I would like to know is, as you wrote this story, how did you know what to leave in and what to leave out? I don't prepare in any way, and I don't have a particular way of writing, except that I start with a sentence and hope another sentence will follow and another sentence. And very often those sentences are spoken in the voice of a character. I don't know where I'm going. I can't say it's exactly like driving blind. It might be like driving at night with sunglasses. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, as I go forward, I see a little bit of what's ahead, but I'm not sure of everything that's going to happen. It's a little scary, um, but it's also more fun for me because I read mm -hmm. find out what's happening and what happens next. So I write for the same reason. Right. But when you write, do you, how often do you rewrite? How much do you go back and rewrite? Or does it depend on the story that you're writing? Rewriting is my day job. I mean, I'm, yeah. I love rewriting. I like <laughs> yeah. it much more than writing, actually. And, <laughs> uh, I yeah, do it yeah, rather compulsively. Um, right. And if you right. change one word, you have to look at that word in the context of the sentence and the paragraph and maybe yeah. even the page. And if they'd let me, I'd go into bookstores, sorry, Emma, and with a red pencil and cross things out. Right. Well, that's the poet part. So um, you told me at, at some point that you, when you were young, you thought you might be a poet. Um, and I see that in these stories. And I just want to, I want to give one example here in the story, Mrs. X. You, um, you have this amazing line for me. It's, and, okay, this is a quote. Don't complicate my life, I shout. And the woman on the 20th floor shakes out her mop and dust curl stars fall on my head. Dust curl stars. Tell me, this is gorgeous stuff. Now, and I can see it so brilliantly, dust curl stars. Where did you, do you just, does that just happen? You just see it. You're rendering something truthfully. Well, I think everybody perceives the, wor the world in his or her own way. And right. In my world, mop dust become float like stars. And well, dust curl stars. It's just, yeah, I mean, I've never heard they, it. That's why they that seem to me. Right. And that is just such a lovely, lovely image. And, and also, um, in that same story, you say, the, the, uh, the protagonist says, the children are left alone in the Sinai desert of the sandbox in this mad city. The Sinai desert of the sandbox. It's just wonderful. And again, I'm assuming that just came to you naturally as you're imagining it. Yes, um, but also I feel that it serves the story uh, because yeah. without, it, without, right. without the Sinai desert, then it's just a couple of kids in a sandbox. But, but and, that's my point. And there's right. no element of danger. Right. Abandoned. Exactly. Exactly. I'm just curious if that immediately came to you or if that was like something that you rethought, but it's probably, about, I probably wrote it about 50 years ago. Well, <laughs> I so I don't think I'm going to remember. But it's there and it's absolutely beautiful. Okay. So um, what was the first story that you ever published? The title story of the book. Today, um, a woman went mad in the supermarket. It was wonderful, published wonderful. in the Saturday Evening Post. Yeah. Okay. Now, here's a question. Did you, um, did you take writing classes? I did not go to college. And I had never met another writer until I became one. 
Right. Uh, but after I was in my 30s, I was married and I had two children. We were living in the suburbs and I began, I decided to take a beginner's writing class at the new school in the city. And it was um, run by Anatole Boyard and it was a mobbed room. And he called on me first to read my story aloud. And I was very did you almost nervous. Die? It was, pardon me? I said, did you almost die? Yes, I, I was yeah. hyperventilating. I read right. it, the eye chart. I mean, with absolutely no expression. And <laughs> first of all, he asked me to come to the front of the room, which was, I was very oh. embarrassed to do that. Oh. I couldn't even oh. sit in my seat and also to spit out my gum, which was <laughs> further embarrassing. So by the time I started oh, reading the story, I was a wreck. And oh, then he asked for comments. Your gum. And the first person who commented, this man said, that was the most boring thing I've ever <gasps> oh. I, I was devastated. I was oh, ready to right. pack it. And I hadn't learned to take criticism yet or well, reject it. ever? Not completely, but we can fake it a little better than I did at <laughs> night. I, I just was going to go oh. home and make jello oh. molds for the rest of my life. But yeah. um, Anatole, Anatole said something to the critic, which was amazing. He said, you have every right not to like the story, but you have an obligation to tell the writer why and, okay. and suggest how she might make it better. Right. And that moment, I learned about revising and teaching, you know, the right. kind of honesty and charity it requires. Right. And right. then he invited me immediately to join an advanced writing group, which was terrific um, and had me read the story to them, but they didn't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> but they told me why and they yeah. suggested how I might make it better. Yeah. And I so felt saw something in you. Right. Yeah. Right. I, felt, I felt much more comfortable. Yeah. So how long was this, what I would call apprenticeship? I was in that class forever, yeah. <laughs> just say. I get it. Uh, I needed the company of other writers desperately. Yeah. The town we right. lived in didn't even have a bookstore. It did have a, a pretty good oh, library, right. which my right. kids and husband and I haunted. But um, there were no other writers to talk to. And going right. to this class, even though we were all relatively neophyte writers, um, they were good company and we were talking yeah. about books we'd read and liked and right. I wasn't even that well read and I learned more about other people's choices. Right. Uh, so that was so very you, exciting. Right. So do you remember what books that you did start to read back then? I mean, what were the books that you read to sort of cut your teeth on as you learned to write? Well, even before that, I had written a short story when I was first married, when I was 22. And my husband was in the Marines and was stationed in North Carolina. And it was a very mm -hmm. isolated life for me. Yeah. And I wrote a short story, but I also, he and I began to read books together and we read um, to, uh, Cat, The Catcher in the Rye. We read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and we read Lie Down in Darkness. And oh, great. oh my goodness. This yeah. was just simply wonderful. Right, and opened up all worlds to you. It did. And then much yeah. later on, I read Grace Paley, who was a right. tremendously strong influence yeah. on me. She okay. gave me permission to write in a neighborhood voice and that domestic life. Right. I mean, Jane Austen says the same thing, that domestic lives matter. And they yeah. also tell you about the larger political picture. Yeah, exactly. When you read exactly. Jane Austen, you understand that women in Georgian times could not inherit. Right. Therefore, they had to become governesses or get married. Right. She doesn't say this, but will become prostitutes. There weren't too many choices for women in those right. days. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. So let me, let's just get back to this book for a minute, because I think of you as a very generous writer. And I mean generous about the whole human condition. Um, you record it with real precision, but there's an underlying sense of largeness that rises through it for me. Um, let me, I'm sorry, just to give you a small example because I love these things so much, but in the story Bodies, I just love this. The protagonist recalls seeing her first naked man when she was young and staying overnight at her friend's house. All right, this is a small part of the story. It's only a few paragraphs, but she sees her friend's father 
um, having opened the door to his bedroom by mistake. And this is how you, as the writer, conclude the experience for this protagonist. Um, I, I should also say the man, as you say, was um, depressed and would later commit suicide. Um, but here is what you write, quote, but in that quick and brilliant moment, she is sure she remembers sunlight in the room. She saw his melancholy in the droop of his genitals and felt a rush of knowledge and of anguish. Gorgeous, Thanks. gorgeous stuff, Hilma. Um, that entire story is so good. Can you, do you remember what gave Genesis to that story? I mean, can you remember what gave an impulse to write that story? Again, or is it, again it began with a sentence and with Carol. Yeah. I knew yeah. there was this educated, cultured, married couple who seemed pretty happy together. Yeah. And I thought, what's going to happen to them? Right. And I was kind of surprised what, by what yeah. happened to them, which I won't give away. No, don't give it away. Like a it's kid's book wonderful. report. Buy the book and read the book and you'll I know. You'll find it's out. Just a, it's just, it's so fabulous. It's just wonderful. And there's a very natural humor, I think, in these stories as well. Are you aware of being funny or are you just doing it because you're just writing that way and it turns out to be funny? And maybe you don't even know you're funny, but what about that humor? I grew Is it up, something that you're aware of or not? You know, I grew up during the Depression, not the funniest period of time, right? in a three-generation household. And I remember money was very tight. And yet I also remember so much laughter. Uh, oh, interesting. And this laughter against the darkness. Yeah. And also right. I find if someone else laughs, I laugh too. It's contagious, if I may use right. that word now. Um, right, right. It's like yawning. And, and yeah. everybody starts. It is, you're right, yeah. But yeah. I remember lying under the kitchen table when I was a child among the shoes and listening to the adults talk and, and their wonderful stories. And they would uh, with laughter all the time. Right. And that's so interesting. Yeah, that's great. It made me yeah. sort of wish that I had been their contemporary and that I could have yeah. that life as well. Right, right. Well, the humor is there and it's stuck right along with the pathos, which is how it always is. I mean, humor and pathos go hand in hand. As you say, you know, it was the depression and yet there was laughter. Um, now, the last story which you read from was your most recent written story in this collection. And the writing is just as strong as ever. Um, was writing this story somehow a different process than writing the others? It was because this story has more autobiographical detail in it than any of my other stories. Yeah. But again, yeah. you know, I told the truth, but I told it slant. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, all the facts are not true, but the main facts of the story, right. the end of a long marriage in the midst of COVID, right. that part is is true and some of the details of it, not right. all of them. But I also right. assigned this truth and what happened to my husband and me to fictional characters. Yeah, which, which is a, a further helpful. way of disguising things. I, get, I think I know writers I tell general truths, factual truths, and then they tell uh, really personal truths and they mix them up that there are universal truths and there are personal right. truths and that that's how you write fiction i think right. exactly exactly one has to find a a character to put what we think of as our personal truths inside of <laughs> right you know? right right um so what what can you tell me about just making this book how did that happen well that i have to thank my daughter the novelist meg wallitzer for making this happen. My husband and I were both hospitalized with COVID, oddly enough, in different hospitals. Oh, yeah. I came down with it first. I came down with it a few days later. Um, and he died while I was still in the hospital. I came home two days later. And because everything was so bizarre, we didn't have any of the usual rituals of mourning. I mean, nobody right. was there to comfort him or see him off. Right. Uh, nobody, we, the children and I couldn't get mm. together in a physical way to see each other. Terrible, her. right. And uh, when Meg was reading these stories during that period, uh, and she called me and said she thought that they would make a collection, I really wasn't interested. First, 
I was <laughs> busy. <laughs> and I was also feeling lousy. I had just yeah, no, I meant just come out of the hospital. Right. I was dealing with right. my husband's shoes next to the bed and his yeah, clothes I were in the closet it. until it. everybody was inoculated, you know. Oh. Later. So things were really difficult. And I think she was trying very hard. I think she was sincere about the stories, but she was trying very hard to cheer me up and which touched me deeply and also made sense. I needed to do something besides right. grieve. I needed to have right. something to do, some work, and I needed something to look forward to, which everyone needs. Yeah, and so exactly. I began the process and she petitioned my agent uh, who sent it to my wonderful editor at Bloomsbury and the rest yeah. of recent history. <laughs> Well, it's a great, a great thing that she did. So thank you to, to Meg. Is there anything in particular, I, I'm just I'm actually really curious about this. Is there anything in particular that you hope your reader um, feels at the end of a story? No, I don't mean like, is there something specific, but is there some sense of what you want to be able to give your reader? I don't think about it when I'm writing. I don't, Right. We think of a reader. I'm the reader when I'm writing. Right. But afterwards, and especially after it's published, I'm hoping I divide people into generations because I'm 91 now. And I think that people of my generation, those who are still alive, uh, I hope that they will have some shock of recognition. Yeah. And young. Okay. Readers, I get it. And I was very pleased that younger readers. Right at the publishing house, really related exactly. to the stories. And that made me enormously happy. And that's another exactly. thing to hope for. Exactly. OK. Um, I think we should probably start some questions here. Um, sure. Let me see if I can figure this out. OK. Um, what have you read? OK, this is the question. All right. What have you read recently that you enjoyed? Is there anything you left out of your book that you wished you left in? You answer first. No, that's for you. These questions oh, are for I you, think, Hilma. I think they're for both of us. That one's, I, in, in the small, tiny print I read, that was for both of us. Well, you go ahead. Or <laughs> I go first. Okay. Very yeah. recently, I reread Diana Atthill's Somewhere Towards, Somewhere's Toward the End, Towards the End. It's British, so it's Towards the End. Um, she was 89 when she wrote it. It's a memoir. And it's so full of life. And she taught me that you don't have to be old on the page. Yeah. Nobody sees you in your pajamas writing. So nobody I know it. really, know, I know you it. don't even know how old you are because you forget. Yeah, I know. Right. Exactly. 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 Okay. That's great. All right. Now here's another one. Thank you, Miss Hilma. Clarify. Uh, you begin, you begin with character and that begins the story. Did you have any plot in mind or the character begins the story? The character tells me the plot. Right. Uh, right. I it's almost as if they're whispering in my ear. I know that right. I have to write it. It's, it's not some magical. No, no. Uh, but I think right. that once I hear the voice of the character, I can start to imagine what might happen in this character's life. Right. That would right. be interesting. I mean, you really right. want a story. You don't want just uh, an everyday occurrence. Though, Cumulative well, everyday occurrences can be in a story, but there has to be right. there has to be a plot. There has to the reader, I think, must desire something, and the writer doesn't have to fulfill that desire, but has to activate it. That's great. That's really really well put. I I, I completely agree. And I mean, in my sense, there's all, I have a vague sense of my idea of plot. Which, and I don't even like that word, but is that something even minimally has to change from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. Exactly. That's all. Exactly. Something has to have changed. And it could be just the tiniest way something, somebody sees something, or it could be a big thing, but whatever. That's, that's what I'm always interested in, you know, in my work is like, there has to be some sort of shift. I mean, maybe that's just, traditional thinking on my part, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I had um, to learn that every story didn't have to end on an epiphany. Right, no, 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 no. But that tiny, some, tiny. even a small minor right. shift takes the, place. The tiniest And it could be internal. Place. It could be yeah, a shift. Exactly, 
but exactly. But can be I, a shift in the relationship between people. But something something has to happen. Something, right. That's how I feel, right? Okay. Here's another question. Okay. Does Meg ask you to read her books early on and do you ask her? We both do. And oh, that's so and we've lovely. done it, we've done it for years, and I've spoken about this because Meg. I say I was a late bloomer. I thought it was, I, I could say I'm a late bloomer, but I actually thought I was over the hill when I was 36 <laughs> publishing a first story and 44 publishing a first novel. It's interesting. Meg was 11 when she published her first story and 22 when she published her first novel. So when she began showing me stories when she was a child, uh, it was very hard as a parent to be critical. I was a mother. I wasn't, I know, I wasn't I know. a literary critic. I was a mother. <laughs> and right. she was very disparaging. She said to me, oh, you just love everything I do. And I realized that I had insulted her in a way. I hadn't respected mm. her as a writer. Of course, you know, I could move her to tears if I said too right. many negative things, but <laughs> she was 11 years old. But right. when, when, we, when she was a grown-up and we began exchanging work in progress. Um, I think we were helpful to each other. I know she was very helpful to me. You'd have to ask her if I was helpful to yeah, her. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you were. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so somebody else says, um, I absolutely loved your stories. I'm so sorry for your loss. In The Great Escape, when the doctor tells Polly how fond he was of Howard, and quote, your whole love story in daily installments, quote, this one's so endearing. My question is, what books are you reading now? So um, I well, think you've I, already told us, but you can tell I, us. Yes, I'm, I, more. I read poetry also. I read it because I enjoy it. And it also right. teaches me about economy and about the music yeah. of language. Uh, right, I, I told reading, you I recognize yeah. you. I, yeah. My characters actually are reading the same poets that I read, Lucille Clifton and Billy Collins. I also read Philip Locke and, and, um, mm -hmm. uh, and other poets as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, reading some very good novels lately. Um, by, what are they? By Joan Silver and mm, by Francine right. Rose's The Vixen, which I mm -hmm. enjoy very much. Mm -hmm. Great. I love reading good. contemporary fiction. Right. OK, great. OK. Let me just see if I can. Um, all right. So all that time in writing class, in one sentence, what did you learn? It seems you do not follow a structured pattern. Rather, story flows from, uh, flows as from a storyteller. Well, it used to flow, now it trickles. Uh, you know, as you get older, words don't come quite as quickly. Um, when I was younger, middle-aged, but younger, I remember, the words used to come so quickly that I would be sometimes, I would be crossing the street and I'd have to take out a bulb yeah. pen and write on the palm of my hand. Or right. if I'm dead and too lazy to get out, I would write on the margin of a newspaper. And of course it was, yeah. it was illegible. I, I, I didn't understand right. any of it in the morning. But I also had this wonderful capacity to remember. If I was somewhere where I couldn't write anything down, yeah. I would keep thinking of it and I would memorize it. I could right. memorize a whole chapter almost. I don't right. think that's going to happen anymore. <coughs> right, that's interesting. So I stick I, closer I mean, to, to my writing implements. Right, I hear what you're saying, okay. Um, Hilma, why have you chosen to work in short stories and what are you working on now? Well, um, I mean, you've obviously worked not only in short stories, you've written many novels as well. Right. But what is the attraction to short stories? I wrote, I read so many short stories, like yeah. Haley's, which I loved. Right. And, um, and John Cheever's. And, yeah. And so I think that I felt that the short story was sort of the apprenticeship of the writer. I understand. That's how I and felt. Now I, I don't feel that way. I don't feel. I like, need to do it. That's so it's, it, it was sort of my adolescence as a writer. And that I the understand. novel was the grown up version of a writer. Um, but once I began, to, and I loved writing short stories, and then um, an editor at a small literary magazine wrote me a very nice note after accepting the story and said, do you have a novel? I'd love to read it if you do. Yeah. And good girl that I was, I wrote a novel. <laughs> once I, and it was published. And once I started writing a novel, 
started writing novels, I felt it was very difficult to go back to the short story again. Yeah. And truthfully, it's been years and years until I wrote The Great Escape. And yeah. now I feel I can go back to that form. Right. right. Uh, for a while, it was really hard. I remember that, I think it was John Cheever who actually said, a short story is something you read while you're waiting to see the dentist. Exactly. That's exactly it. And for a writer, I, it's like having root canal. <laughs> right, right, right. But I also remember somebody, and I don't think it was Cheever, but somebody said, um, you need to write a story that's good enough that if you're reading it in the dentist's office, you want to steal the magazine if oh. you get interrupted, you know, if they call you in. Oh, absolutely. You, you, want to, you want to be writing something that they think, I have to steal this magazine because I need to finish this story. <laughs> an analogy to that. When my, yeah. son, my older sister and I were kids, we were riding on one of the city buses in Brooklyn. And my sister was a wonderful storyteller. She did, wasn't a writer, but she, in the oral tradition of our family, she was telling this marvelous story. And the man behind her said, poked her on the back. And we thought maybe she was talking too loud. He said, right. Can you hurry up and finish? I get off at the next stop and I have oh, to see what happens. <laughs> it's wonderful. But that's a wonderful story. That's it in a nutshell. Bingo. That's what you want. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's a great, great story. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, your first published book was about a woman losing her husband at a young age. Your more recent story is about a woman losing her husband after a long marriage. Any thoughts about those, forgive the pun, bookends? It sounds like I'm the queen of thanatology, actually, but uh, I, I, that wasn't in my mind. I think yeah. if you're human and you love people, that you automatically yeah. know about loss. Right. You may not have experienced right. it yet, but you can, you can imagine it. And you know, in the yeah. early book, I imagined it. And, the right. late, and in this book, in The Great Escape Story, I, I knew it. I didn't, I didn't I, know that. Right. I remember hearing a writing teacher years and years ago talking to a high school class. And he said, you've all experienced loss. He said, you know, you don't, you don't need to wait for somebody really close to you to die. You've had a pet die. You've had a friend that disowned you. You know, and it was like so interesting to realize, right, by the time we're five or ten, we've, we know these feelings, even though um, they obviously get worse and bigger. Exactly. <laughs> but, Exactly. I always anyway. say that, you know, having a pet is like having a rehearsal for death. Well, that's, I think usually that's you outlive your pets. Right. I think that's what he's trying to say. Okay. Um, do you always know when you've started a short story versus a novel? And if not, when does that become clear to you? Um, I'm not sure. It's been such yeah. a long time uh, that I've written a novel, too. Um, I think the difference between a short story and a novel is not just that the novel is longer, which it usually is, but that it's wider, that it's more yeah. encompassing, right. that some of the minor characters take on important roles in a novel, where in the short story, they're just uh, bit, bit actors, they have right. cameos. And the, the novel seems more expansive to me, even if it's a short novel. Right. Even if it right. takes place in one day, I think of Alice Munro's short stories that took place over years and years, and Mrs. Dalloway taking place in one day, a novel taking place in one day. So there are no hard and fast rules about this. Right, exactly, exactly. And you just figure it out as you start it, um, or as you continue it. Um, and here is, I think, the last one. I'm not sure. Um, Thank you so much for this conversation. I'm so sorry for your loss. I so appreciate your love and lifting up of daily and real domestic life. It is rich and important and universal. Can you talk about your writing process in practical terms as an amateur writer? I love to hear these details of how creativity can happen in the day-to-day -day grind. Oh, well, thank you for your, your kind words about my husband. I appreciate that. Um, my, my circumstances as a writer changed over the years. When I first began writing those short stories and was attending that workshop, 
We lived in a very small house. My husband was a psychologist. He would sit, we were two typewriter family. He would sit at one end of the kitchen table with a standard typewriter. I sat at the other end. He was typing up patient reports and I was typing short stories. And the kids were running it. around yelling and the dog was barking and it didn't matter. And then, yeah. then suddenly I grew neurotic about it. And uh, my husband, oh. would, he would also play jazz uh, music very loud on the stereo. So, and I, I needed quiet. I needed yeah. peace. I needed no interruptions. Yeah. I had to close the door and lock. And now, of course, I've gotten what I wished for. Mm. And, and it's bittersweet. Yeah. Um, it's right. quiet here, except, you know, I'm in, the, I'm in the city on the 18th floor and I hear, and, and for a while I heard nothing but sirens, ambulance sirens right, going right. by. Exactly. That really enters the mood of your writing. All, all the noises you hear in the world enter the story in some way. When, even though I complained about my husband playing that music so loud, I realized that the jazz maybe jazzed up my stories. I know. I know. It's interesting. Um, and one can only control so much of what one is exposed to during their life as a writer and so you just absorb what is there and you do um, what you can yeah exactly do you um, need I, peace and quiet do i need peace and quiet i do i mean you know i mean i um i've noticed that i need quiet inside the room that i'm working in but external noise like through the window is almost comforting to me but I reminded don't. that life is there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But inside inside the room that I'm working in, I really do need it to be quiet. Yeah. Me, me too. Me yeah. Too. Yeah. Okay. So there's um, one more question here. How do you know? Uh, how do you know when the story reaches its end? Do you plan the end of the story before you start? There are times when I might write a last sentence, but I have no yeah. idea what the, how I'm going to get there. Yeah, yeah. And, or I have an idea and I'm completely diverted from it. It's like right. somebody put up a detour sign in the road and I have to drive around it. Right, right. And right. so it can, it can work both ways. And of course, if right. you don't know where it's going, you can end up with 150 pages where, you know, uh, I always say Joseph Heller wrote a novel called Something Happened, but I would write a novel called Nothing Happened <laughs> because it just doesn't go anywhere. Right, right. That's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I've, I've written, I have written the ends of um, stories without having any story ahead of it. And then all of a sudden at some point, the story will fall into place and I'll realize, oh, I have the end. <laughs> yes. If I'm lucky enough to find it. To have the end. But I'm such find a sometimes, messy writer. I find sometimes that the story should end two paragraphs before. Or oh, that's interesting. Before. Yeah. You do that too? Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm, I'm just cutting things all the time. But yeah, anyway. I'm, I'm, my students used to complain that I was changing their four generation sagas to haiku. But, <laughs> Well, you know what? That's okay. I mean, whatever. Anyway, so I think we're um, out of time here, and it was absolutely lovely to spend this time with you, Hilma. Just wonderful, wonderful book. You're a wonderful writer, and <laughs> this, I, I'm so honored to be here with you. Thank you very much for doing this. You're so, 